APM ASEAN Inc. Deputy of Coordination for Quality Improvement, Professor Dr. R. Agus Sartono, MBA. Honorable Chairman of Universitas Kristen Indonesia Foundation, Insinyur Edi R. Sinulinga, MBA. Honorable Rector of Universitas Kristen Indonesia, Dr. Daniswaraka Haryono, SH, MH, MBA. Dean of the Faculty of Education and Teacher Training, Universitas Kristen Indonesia, Dr. Sunarto M. Hum. Dean of the Faculty of Education and Tra Teacher Training, UST Yogyakarta, Mr. Nanang Subketi, SPD, MPD. Distinguished speakers and ladies and gentlemen. Good morning and welcome to Universitas Kristen Indonesia on this special event, International Conference of Education and Science, or ICES, organized by the Faculty of Education and Teacher Training for today's event. This year is the second time that the, the uh, Faculty of Education and Teacher Training Universitas Kristen Indonesia has organized this international conference. My name is Herto Bastian Abul and I am your master of a ceremony for today's event. Before we start, allow me to share some information with you. Members of this conference are presenters and participants. Presenters are those who will present the results of their research while participants are those who participate by watching or observing this conference. Presenters have to log in to Zoom by using member ID, and for presenters who log in without using member ID will not be allowed to join the Zoom meeting. Presenters must register according to the rundown that has been shared before. And for participants, you may join this conference by streaming on FKIP UKI YouTube channel, LPPM UKI YouTube channel, Prodi P Matematika Uki YouTube channel and FKIP UST YouTube channel. And please keep your microphone muted until you are allowed to speak by the committee during this conference. When it comes to question and answer session, please go to the Zoom chat room or YouTube comment section to deliver your question. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let us begin our International Conference of Education and Science in opening prayer led by Pastor No Ibrahim Boiliu MTH. Time is yours. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, now I will lead us to pray according to Christian beliefs. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, thank you for today. As a day blessed by you for being there in this conference. Father, we pray that you will bless this conference. And we pray, bless Conference Committee, bless all of the keynote speakers, invited speakers, all the participants and all the presenters, and God bless this conference. Father, we hope you bless this conference until finishing. Father, we pray, bless our campus, Universitas Christian Indonesia, bless our faculty, FK Puki, and bless all of the devices we use. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank, Thank you, you, Pastor Poiliu. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the national anthem.
Mars of Universitas Kristen Indonesia. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank God for every blessing we receive and his love we could organize this event today. Um, His Excellency, Mr. Professor Dr. Muhajir Effendi, MAP, Coordinator of the Minister of Human Development and Culture. His Excellency, Minister of Education and Culture, Mr. Nadim Anwar Makarim, represented by Professor Insinyur Nizam, MSP, PhD. Your next TV, BSP, and all people who have supported this event. Salam Utabarat MSC, Vice Rector of Student Affairs, Law and Cooperation, Universitas Kristen Indonesia. Honorable Fellow Deans of Universitas Kristen Indonesia and Universitas Sarjana Wiyata Taman Siswa Yogyakarta. Honorable Head of study program Universitas Kristen Indonesia and Universitas Sarjana Wiyata Taman Siswa Yogyakarta. Honorable keynote speaker and honorable presenter and participant of the second international conference of education and science. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let us express our gratitude to God Almighty who has given his grace and blessing, so that we can all attend the seminar room at Universitas Kristen Indonesia, Jakarta, offline and online, in a healthy and fit condition to participate in the second international conference of education and science 2020, Jakarta, with the theme New Normal on Education. As stated by the Rector of Universitas Kristen Indonesia, Mr. Dr. Daniswara K. Harjono S.A. M.A. MBA, in his remarks this morning that is this conference was organized by Faculty Teacher Training and Education as a series of the 67th anniversary of Universitas Kristen Indonesia. Distinguished guests, as we all know, the Industrial Revolution 4.0 has a big impact on every aspect of life. In addition to providing many the benefits and conveniences, the Industrial Revolution 4.0 also presents challenges for society. The development of science and education plays an important role in facing this era of Industrial Revolution 4.0. Point zero. Faculty of Teacher Training and Education wants to answer these challenges by organizing this international conference. The purpose of this conference is to increase the number of international publications by Indonesia academics in the field of natural science, social science, and education. Then, this conference also aims to increase cooperation between researchers from various countries and at the same time as publication media for Indonesia academics. The benefits then can be taken from this conference are improving the quality of Indonesian academics, especially in the field of natural science, social science, and education, and becoming a medium for international publication 
for Indonesian academics. Finally, another benefit from this conference is to collaborate with nation and international institution in research in the field of natural science, social science, and education. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, from a series of events that have been designed by conference committee for two days, starting from December 9 to December 10, 2020, still a very adhere to health protocol, we must wash hand and keep the day stand. That is for now, enjoy the conference. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam namun budaya, Om Swastiastu, salam kebajikan, Rahayu. Thank you, Dr. Sunarto. Ladies and gentlemen, opening speech by Rector of Universitas Kristen Indonesia, Dr. Dani Suaraka Haryono, SHMH, MBA. Honorable Bapak Profesor Dr. Haji Muhajir Effendi, Coordinating Minister for Human Development and Culture Republic of Indonesia, represented by Profesor Dr. Agus Hartono. The Honorable Bapak Mr. Nadim Anbar Makarim, Minister of Education and Culture Republic of Indonesia, represented by Profesor Insinyur Nisam, PhD. Chairperson of the UKI Foundation, Bapak Insinyur Edi R. Sinulinga, MBA, invited speakers of the conference, Bapak Dr. Dr. Andes Sunarto, MHUM, Dean of Faculty of Education and Teacher Training, Universitas Kristen Indonesia, Bapak Nanang Subekti, SPD, MPD, Dean of Faculty of Education and Teacher Training, Universitas Sarjana Wiyata, Jogja, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Shalom. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. Good morning. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all the second international conference of education and science 2020 held by the Faculty of Education and Teachers Training of Universitas Kristen Indonesia. For researchers and faculty members, academic conference or seminar like this are very important because in events like this, we have the opportunity to listen to experts of relevant fields, share current findings of research or meet colleagues from different institutions. The pandemic, however, has hindered us from having this important meeting on site. We are grateful that we can still organize this conference online. We thanks the advancement of technology that has made this occasion possible. The conference brings educator, education specialists, and administrator together to discuss the current issues in education as stated in the theme of the conference, New Normal of Education. As we all are aware, the COVID-19 pandemic has changed our prospects in schools and education for many years to come. Academics are expected to be a few steps ahead in providing solutions to many problems in the community. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the future of our generation lies today in the hands of the teachers. Due to eight months' experience dealing with pandemic situation, we are forced to carry out our teaching activities without lowering down our expectation. The current situation was not or 
was never forecast prior to the end of pandemic. The traditional practice of schooling is disrupted and has driven us educator to change our perspective in classroom learning or teaching methods, for example. I'm sure many teachers or educators do all their best to make learning from home activities as productive, as fun as possible for the students. Aside from the pandemic, we educators should also observe other issues related to human resource development, the industrial revolution 4.0. Indonesia entering a place where the productive age population is more than the non-productive, also known as demographic bonus. Skill mismatch or lack of skills, which causes less competitive labor market compared to the other countries are some of the issues that must be put on in consideration when education is concerned. From this conference, I hope many discoveries and interesting development in your respective fields will be discussed and disseminated not only among the participants, but who are privileged to be able to attend this prestigious event, but also to largest audiences. Congratulations to the Faculty of Education and Teachers Training for successfully organizing this conference. Enjoy the conference day and the networking. By the grace of God, I officially open the second International Conference of Education and Science 2020. Thank you very much. God bless us all. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Santi 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 Om. Namo Buddhaya. Rector will be the gong to open this conference officially accompanied by Chairman of Universitas Kristen Indonesia Foundation, Dean of Faculty of Education and Teacher Training, and Chairman of the Committee of this International Conference. We invite uh, to beat the gong. Once again, we would like to invite the Chairman of Universitas Kristen Indonesia, Foundation and also Dean of Faculty of Education and Teacher Training, Chairman of the Committee, and we would like to invite Vice Dean of Faculty of Education and Teacher Training to accompany Rector in beating the gong. Let's give a big round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now official that the International Conference of Education and Science is starting now. Thank you. We also would like to welcome His Excellency Coordinating Minister for Human Development and Culture, Professor Dr. Ha Muhajir Effendi, MAP, who has uh, joined us on Zoom room now. Welcoming speech by Chairman of Universitas Kristen Indonesia Foundation, Insinyur Edi Reynald Sinulinga, MBA. His Excellency, Ministry, for Coordinating Ministry for Human Development and Culture Affairs, Bapak Profesor Dr. Haji Muhajir Effendi, MIP, represented by the Deputy for uh, Quality Development Coordination, Professor Dr. Agus Sartono, MBA. His Excellency, Ministry for Education and Culture Affairs, Bapak Profesor Nadim Makarim, represented by Directorate General for Higher Education, Professor Insinyur Nizam, MSc, PhD. And then uh, our President of University of Christian University of Indonesia, Dr. Daniswara Kaharjono, SHMH MBA, the Dean 
for teacher training and education of department of UKI, Christian University Dr. Of Sunarto, Indonesia, Master of Law, Dr. Daniswara Saharjono, the Dean for University MH MBA, sorry, the Dean for Teachers Training and Education Department for University Sarjana Wiyata, Taman Siswa, Yogyakarta, Mr. Nanang Subakti, SPD, M, Master of Education, Sarjana Our invited Wiyata, keynote speakers, Taman Siswa, Yogyakarta, and all Mr. Nanang Subakti, SPD, and gentlemen, M, Master of Education, Shalom and best wishes to our invited you. keynote speakers. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Guests, ladies Om and gentlemen, to Shalom budaya, and best wishes to all of you. Good Assalamualaikum. Praise and gratitude to the presence of God Almighty, the creator of the universe, who always pours joy, health, and spirit to all of us, so that we are given the opportunity to participate in the second International Conference on Education, or FIEP, have excelled in various things such as research, publication, and improvement of academic position. For that, I thank the Dean, Dr. Sunarto, Master of Law and the Deputy Dean, Mr. Roni Gunawan, Master of Education, as well as, as well as all the heads of the study program for the leadership and cooperation that have been shown by each lecturer and faculty members in improving the quality and the quantity of the three Dharma or we call it as the three responsibilities of higher education, which leads to the improvement of higher education accreditation. What is done by FKIP UKI can be an example and motivation for other departments or faculties in improving the quality and the quantity of their three dharma, which consists of education and teaching, research and community services. All departments must be able to build a superior golden generation, even in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. This means that all of us must continue to have collective optimism while still believing that in the midst of challenges and crisis, we still have the opportunity to become winners, namely to become a superior golden generation and also a superior university according to our vision and missions. In the midst of challenges and crisis, as one of the, the oldest campuses the in Indonesia, winners, the Indonesian Christian University, or UKI, golden generation, which was born in 1953, has devoted to itself our for decades, for decades midst to advancing national crisis, education. As one of the, the oldest campuses the from year to year, the Indonesian continues University to try to develop itself born in 1953 and improve its achievement to become a leading university and become a center of excellence in education at the national, regional, and international levels. However, the challenges faced by UKI is in, realize, in realizing its vision and mission are getting bigger from year to year. Not only internal challenges, but most importantly, external challenges. Since the doors of in the 21st century were open, universities around the world have been racing to accelerate internal the transformation into campuses that are super adaptive to global changes and demands, especially in this area of technology disruption. Universities around the world, in the midst of current global competition, UKI continues to strive to become a superior university, super adaptive, capable of responding to the needs of the time, especially in this area as an educational institution, who keep plays a role in facilitating a quality and open learning process, especially through the independent campus, capable of responding through independent campus programs to produce graduates which exemplary character and growth skills. For this reason, learning and behave formation literacy skills. Hopefully, this international conference will be the 
will be a step in our series of steps towards achieving UKI goals. Are a series of steps that must be the intention to achieve the vision of education and determine the best strategy for achieving UKI success. Hopefully, this conference illnesses and behavior for those of you who celebrate. Skills. We wish you a very Hopefully, happy Christmas this and welcome the new year of 2021. May success and prosperity accompany all the steps in our life. And for those, God bless you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Celebrate Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan, and, and, and FIFA University, Christian University of May success Indonesia. and prosperity accompany all the steps in our life. And for those, God bless you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Celebrate Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. It is such an honor for us that in this International Conference of Education and Science, we have His Excellency Coordinating Minister for Human Development and Culture, Republic of Indonesia, and Honorable Director 
General of Higher Education Ministry of Education and Culture Republic of Indonesia as keynote speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our first keynote speaker, His Excellency Coordinating Minister for Human Development and Culture Republic of Indonesia, Professor Dr. Hamu Hajir Effendi, MAP. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Shalom, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya. Very good morning to all of the uh, International Conference of Education and Science 2020. My dear colleague, uh, Director General of Higher Education, Professor uh, Izan, who at this moment representing the Minister of Education and Culture. My dear colleagues, uh, Rector of Universitas Kristen Indonesia, Dr. Dennis Wara, uh, the Chairman of UKI Foundation, Senior Eddie Rainaki Sinulinga, MBA. My dear colleagues, uh, Dean of uh, FKIP, Universitas Kristen Indonesia, uh, the speakers and participants. First of all, uh, <clears throat> Saya menyampaikan puji syukur kepada Allah Subhanahu wa taala karena pagi hari ini kita bisa hadir di forum yang sangat baik ini. On behalf of the Coding Minister of Human Development and Culture, I would like to say that uh, deep deep very great His Excellency Professor Dr. Muajir Effendi at this moment unable to join uh, this uh, very special international conference due to very tight schedule. As everybody knows that at this moment, the coding ministers of human development and cultures, Professor Majer Effendi, also act as the interim ministers of uh, social welfare. Therefore, the schedule are very tight. And this morning, ask me to represent him on this very special uh, conference. Bapak Ibu, Saudara sekalian yang saya hormati, kurang lebih delapan bulan terakhir, Indonesia berjuang menghadapi pandemi uh, virus corona atau COVID. This uh, COVID uh, pandemic not only affected the health sectors but also the educational sectors significantly. And Indonesia is not the only one because more than 180 uh, countries has to close school and universities. Indonesia sendiri. Uh, Survei pelaksanaan pelajaran selama COVID ini juga <coughs> terdampak setidaknya at least there are more than 640,000 more than 640,000 school and madrasah and more than 68 million so just imagine the, the magnitude <coughs> more than 68 million student yang terdampak uh, oleh adanya uh, COVID-19 ini and they all have to do the long distance learning program. Semuanya harus terpaksa melakukan pembelajaran jarak jauh. Karena apa? Karena pemerintah lebih mementingkan kesehatan. <coughs> because the government think that health is the most important thing rather than education. Therefore, at the moment, we have to close the school and madrasah across the country. Dengan kondisi geografis, sosial, ekonomi yang beragam, tentu long distance learning <coughs> have many such challenges. Ya. Daerah-daerah uh, yang memadai bisa melaksanakan pembelajaran tatap muka, tetapi tidak semua daerah bisa melakukan. We all know that at least there are more than 60 uh, more than sorry, more than 46,000 more than 46,000 out of 600 46,000 school and madrasa tidak punya akses terhadap electricity and internet. So uh, if those 46,000 school are not have access to the electricity and internet, mean that they are not able to conduct the long distance learning program. Okay? Even though uh, 600,000 school and madrasa has electricity and internet, but not all the uh, students or family has the infrastructure such as uh, uh, mobile phone or in general has a device. Even though the student have the devices and internet connection, 
but not all the students have the capacity or capability uh, to buy the uh, <coughs> uh, pulsa. Ya. Itulah tantangan-tantangan yang, yang terjadi uh, bagi proses pembelajaran tatap muka di Indonesia. Dan oleh sebab itu, maka pemerintah memberikan intervensi, pemberian bantuan uh, internet uh, kepada siswa dengan memberikan bantuan pembelian pulsa. Dan ini menjadi prioritas utama bagi pemerintah daerah sesuai dengan Undang-Undang 23 tahun 2015, karena pendidikan ini merupakan urusan konkuren, maka untuk memastikan agar akses internet dan listrik pada tahun-tahun mendatang bisa lebih baik. Bapak-Ibu sekalian yang saya hormati, kondisi COVID-19 ini memaksa kita dan satuan pendidikan serta pengelola perguruan tinggi untuk berpikir kreatif, mencari solusi bagaimana agar proses pembelajaran bisa berjalan dengan baik. Pemerintah menyadari bahwa keputusan pembelajaran di rumah merupakan keputusan yang sulit. It's a tough choice whether we have to open the school or we have to close for the, uh, for the moment. Dan kita memilih uh, lebih mementingkan kesehatan uh, karena kita tidak ingin. We don't want to make the school or to, to make it happen or uh, we don't want to have it. The school become the, the new cluster for uh, COVID-19. So that is why Uh, for the time uh, being, we are, we are close to school. <tuh> Bapak-Ibu sekalian, kita juga menyadari bahwa pembelajaran di rumah pasti punya banyak kelemahan. Yeah? The long distance learning program uh, also have uh, the, the limitations. We know that the student have to, to go with the knowledge, skill, attitude, and values. In terms of knowledge, Some of the students may get the, the knowledge through the long distance learning program, but we do agree that it's not the maximum alternative. Pasti ada keterbatasan karena tidak adanya interaksi antara siswa, guru, mahasiswa dengan dosen. Kemudian yang kedua, skill. Siswa memerlukan praktikum di laboratorium. Skill tentu tidak akan didapat hanya dengan pembelajaran jarak jauh. Apalagi menyangkut masalah attitude dan values yang kadang memerlukan interaksi antara siswa sesama siswa di sekolah. Itulah tantangan yang kita hadapi dan kita menyadari itu. Dari keempat aspek tersebut, tentu memang yang paling mengkhawatirkan yaitu menyangkut masalah penguasaan skill. Karena praktikum itu menjadi sulit. Pemerintah menyadari betul tantangan itu, dan oleh sebab itu menerbitkan surat keputusan bersama selama masa pandemi ini, untuk mengatasi pelajaran, yaitu surat keputusan antara Menteri Pendidikan, Menteri Kesehatan, Menteri Agama, dan Menteri Dalam Menteri, untuk mengatur satuan pendidikan satuan pendidikan mana yang dapat melaksanakan pembelajaran tetap muka dengan tetap melaksanakan protokol kesehatan. Yang utama tentu di daerah-daerah yang zona hijau, kemudian sekolah pendidikan atas, sekolah menengah atas. Kenapa demikian? Karena kita beranggapan siswa-siswa anak sekolah menengah atas itu is mature enough untuk melaksanakan protokol kesehatan dengan baik. Sementara itu, in a yellow and orange and even red zones area, itu sekolah dilarang untuk membuka pembelajaran tatap muka karena sangat berbahaya bagi penyebaran COVID-19 ini. Dan anak-anak tetap harus melaksanakan pembelajaran dari rumah. Pembelajaran tatap muka harus dikoordinasikan antara satuan pendidikan dengan gugus tugas COVID-19. Pada 7 Agustus 2020, pemerintah kembali memperbaiki SKB 4 Menteri, di mana zona kuning dan zona kepulauan diizinkan untuk melaksanakan pembelajaran tatap muka. We do believe that in some remote areas, Uh, where the people uh, come and go are very uh, small in, in terms of number, we do believe that the uh, spread of the COVID uh, disease is uh, very limited. <coughs> Oleh sebab itu, kita mengizinkan di daerah-daerah itu boleh dibuka. Tentu saja dengan tetap melaksanakan protokol kesehatan. Para peserta International Conference yang saya hormati, pemerintah tentu menyadari tekanan dari uh, keluarga, masyarakat, karena di masa pandemi ini, anak-anak yang harus belajar di rumah juga mengakibatkan tips tipsumsi di dalam rumah tangga. 
banyak orang tua yang merasa frustasi karena tidak saja uh, tidak mampu mendampingi putra putrinya, tetapi juga selama anak-anak harus belajar di rumah, orang tua menjadi terganggu, tidak bisa uh, bekerja. Karena selama ini pada saat anak-anak di sekolah, orang tua bisa uh, bekerja. Terhadap persoalan ini, maka pada tanggal 20 November uh, 2020, pemerintah merebitkan keputusan bersama empat menteri ya, diperbaiki kembali. Dan disusul kemudian juga dengan surat edaran Dirjen Dikti yang nanti saya kira uh, Excellency Director General akan uh, sharing kepada kita semua tentang perlunya memberikan kelonggaran uh, kepada pemerintah daerah Kabupaten, kota, dan provinsi untuk membuka sekolah sesuai dengan kondisi daerah masing-masing. Karena kita tahu bahwa banyak sekolah-sekolah yang ada di daerah-daerah yang zero kasus COVID-19. Dan itu artinya sekolah-sekolah tersebut dapat dibuka. Tetapi sekali lagi, setiap sekolah, setiap satuan pendidikan dan perguruan tinggi harus mengisi, harus melakukan self-assessment terlebih dahulu dengan cermat memastikan kesiapan e, untuk melaksanakan belajar tatap muka secara berjenjang, berkoordinasi dengan e, dinas pendidikan kabupaten kota dan provinsi dan gugus tugas COVID-19 kabupaten kota dan provinsi untuk mendapatkan approval apakah proses pembelajaran tatap muka bisa berjalan dengan baik atau tidak. Ini perlu dilakukan karena apa? Karena harus memperhatikan juga kapasitas layanan kesehatan di kabupaten kota dan provinsi. Excellencies, the seminar participants, sengaja saya bicarakan beberapa kebijakan dan usaha perintah di bidang pendidikan pada masa pandemi ini. Dengan apa? Ini sebagai pemantik diskusi sesuai dengan topik uh, international conference ini. Saya yang juga lahir dan masih merupakan bagian dari kampus meyakini betul bahwa budaya berpikir kritis dan reflektif adalah suatu yang mutlak di lingkungan kampus. Dengan adanya acara ini yang khusus mengangkat tema The New Normal on Education, saya berharap dalam sembilan nanti lahir pemikiran-pemikiran kritis dan inovatif yang nantinya berkontribusi untuk membangun dan wujudkan dunia pendidikan yang berkemajuan. Rasa optimis saya semakin meningkat setelah melihat para pembicara di forum ini. I know that the guest speakers are coming from around the world, and this also set a challenge for us. Do in the future we really need a such huge building to deliver the higher education? If we can do it in more efficient way. Karena kali ini juga menarik bagi kita, karena kita juga melihat di belahan dunia banyak perguruan tinggi yang harus tutup. karena tidak mampu membiayai biaya operasionalnya. Untuk itu, dengan mengharap rahmat dari ayah Tuhan Maha Esa, eh, saya berharap betul bahwa Second International Conference on Education and Science ini bisa berjalan dengan baik dan memberikan rekomendasi yang konstruktif. Demikian yang dapat saya sampaikan. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya. God bless all. All the best to all the speaker and seminar participant. Thank you very much. Thank you, His Excellency. Ladies and gentlemen, now we have our second keynote speaker, His Excellency Minister of Education and Culture, Nadim Anwar Makarim, BA, MBA, which at this time represented by Director General of Higher Education, Ministry of Education and Culture, Republic of Indonesia, Professor Insinyur Nizam, MSC, PhD. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Excellency, Pak Sartono, Deputy Coordinating Minister of Human Resource, and Dr. Dennis Wara, Director of Minister of Education Indonesia, And distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. Once again, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. May peace be upon us uh, in this uh, special occasions. First of all, on behalf of uh, Ministry Nadim Anwar Makarim, he sent his regard uh, and apology for not uh, able to join this uh, special conference. 
uh, as Prof. Agus just mentioned, uh, we are in a very rapid adaptation to the new normal that uh, we are all facing uh, globally. Uh, uh, the, in the seminar, please allow me to share screen. Uh, on the adaptations of higher education institutions uh, during the pandemic in education, research, and community uh, services. We see the very rapid uh, transformations in our universities. Uh, uh, I just put some of the main strategies uh, and policy in response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. First, one week after the president uh, announced the first case of COVID-19 in Indonesia on the 2nd of March. Uh, yes. 9th of March, uh, the government released a decree to instruct everyone, every school and campus to prevent pandemic spread by study from home, work from home, and doing uh, uh, protect, protective uh, activities or promote healthy uh, in schools and campuses. At the same time, we also mobilize and prepare our medical faculties and university hospitals for uh, uh, indicating the COVID-19 by establishing a testing center for COVID-19. Uh, close to 10,000 tests per day has been conducted by our medical uh, our laboratories and medical faculties and university hospitals. And we also prepare university hospitals for COVID-19 patient treatment. And currently many of the university hospitals are uh, doing a very good job in uh, helping with the patients. And we also prepare 8,000 beds at training centers for uh, self isolation and quarantine. That is in uh, late March uh, 2020. We already prepared 18,000 beds for uh, self isolation and quarantine. We also mobilize student volunteers to help with COVID 19 mitigations for doing information, uh, competitions, and education uh, because this is the main aspect actually to prevent from the virus spread. And we also mobilize and promote our campus to conduct applied research to mitigate the pandemic. Because we know that uh, higher education is actually the uh, center for research and development of the nation. So we mobilize the resources in our campuses to prepare with, uh, to conduct research uh, related to uh, mitigation of the pandemic. And we also provide also support for uh, 816,000 students who were affected by uh, the pandemic because the pandemic not only affect the health, but also the, the economy of their parents. Uh, so uh, we provide this almost 1 million uh, financial support for higher education students, in addition to millions in the uh, uh, basic uh, and secondary education. We also provide the internet access for uh, almost eight million students and lecturers in the university. Uh, for the online learning, we, we coordinate and collaborate with the Ministry of Communication and Information with internet providers to whitelist universities and learning resource uh, site. So to enable students uh, campuses which uh, might not be ready to conduct online learning. So we provide the uh, national platform to be used uh, freely by universities in doing the online learning. Okay. Prof Nijam, interupsi, mohon maaf untuk share screen-nya belum terlihat Prof Nijam. Yun Pak Apunten. Hmm. Apakah bisa dilihat? Belum, belum. Saya sudah share screen atau saya keluar dulu nanti masuk lagi. Apakah screennya sudah bisa dilihat? Belum, Prof Nizam. Belum, belum, belum Prof Nizam nih kok. Baik, kalau begitu saya, saya harus riset berarti saya harus keluar dulu sebentar nanti saya masuk lagi. Mohon maaf. Oh ngatan J, J buat nanti atas menopo Prof. Di pun teng. Matur nuwun rawuhipun Prof Agus Hartono. 
Deh. Ini. Sebentar menika untuk tim karena kendala teknis dengan perangkatnya jadi harus support. Demikian. Monggo untuk host Matulun semuanya untuk partisipan. Sorry for the technical trouble. Uh, I'll try to share my screen again. Can you see the screen? Not yet, from Nizam. Okay. Anyway, so I will not use the uh, proper implementations if that is the, the, the case. So I'll just uh continue my presentations without uh sharing the screen so we, we the government prepare the support for MCT in implementing the online learning by providing a national platform for uh, course delivery uh available uh, with the MOOC, with the uh all the resources uh, in in terms of modules more than 3,000 modules are available in the uh, national platform in Sumatra. And within a few uh, months, we also like to share their resources. So the, the spirit of sharing, the spirit of Gotong Royong is during this pandemic. Uh, but education is about learning. So we have to uh, open up students uh, like soft skills like uh, leaderships and their their wholeness of uh, uh, the university students so beyond online we have to give meaning to educations so we we try to provide that through many many uh, ways first the online learning itself, the student actually can take courses not only from their own uh, faculty or from their own uh, university but they can also take lectures from other cities, like uh, we have the webinars. We can host or we can uh, interact, interact between universities, between students from one university to the other through uh, online collaboration. The online learning can the course from other, other campus, as well as uh, students can collaborate uh, from campus to campus. And we promote students to uh, join and volunteers uh, and thousands upon thousands of students join this volunteer activity. And also project, many of the student project in addressing the pandemic uh, uh, in a way, like preparing the uh, mask, uh, face shields, masks, and also uh, preparing for uh, disinfectants and many things the student can, can do uh, through project, through their activities, as well as assisting uh, their, their uh, lecturers, their professors in developing medical equipments. So this has been a very uh, for students and uh, lecturers. And beyond online educations, uh, we also see, uh, especially in the, in the medical uh, students, more than 15,000 uh, medical student apply uh, to the volunteer activity from medical faculties, nursing, public health, pharmacy, psychology, midwifery. We join uh, hand in hand to help the government, to help the local government in mitigating the, the pandemics. We provide them with the uh, curriculum they follow, although they, they do it volunteer 
uh, through online, but we follow the curriculum led by the Faculty of Medicine uh, at University of Indonesia. So they get, they, they get credit for what they uh, do during the voluntary activity. And also students from engineering, students from social sciences, they conduct uh, research, they conduct uh, observations, uh, and there are a paper uh, regarding the situation, also producing things like hand sanitizers, uh, protective counts, fish uh, masks, and many things, and then distribute uh, that to uh, hospitals, to uh, police stations, and to the public. Uh, so they engage close with the uh, community to help with the uh, pandemic. And also in research uh, and development, we see our universities are doing very well. They develop uh, like ventilators, uh, more than 10 uh, prototypes from universities. And they are not only come as prototype, but they go through trial and now are being uh, produced in uh, manufactured in many of the industrial partners. So this is a very uh, interesting activities and, and interesting breakthrough. Although we are pandemic, but the quality of our researchers uh, is beyond expectation. They do a very good job developing uh, medical equipment, uh, rapid tests, uh, using artificial intelligence to, to track uh, patients and uh, COVID-19 detection through uh, many uh, innovative devices. And this is not only come as a paper or as a prototype, but go into productions in a very short time. Uh, and this has been a very uh, encouraging for us to continue what they do, what our university do uh, beyond the pandemic. And we also see the uh, paper productivity, the productivity of our campus is also increasing uh, significantly during this pandemic. So we see that the pandemic not only uh, transform our education to digital education, but also the, it unleashed the power of the university, especially in research and development. Uh, and many other activities like uh, campus course teaching, uh, very good activities, because we know that, as uh, Professor Sartana mentioned, many of schools are not ready with the uh, online learning. So we send students uh, through, because they stay in their home, so they can teach uh, kids around their home. Of course, with the uh, big protocols to make sure that transmissions of virus first. So more than 10 students uh, currently join the program of campus course uh, teaching. Uh, so the student help to assist the teachers in uh, delivering uh, teaching lectures to uh, juniors, to, to students in elementary uh, and kindergarten uh, schools. And student exchange, we used to have a student exchange, a uh, national student exchange. Now we conduct student exchange virtually. So it's national virtual student mobility. Uh, so students can collaborate, share uh, thought, ideas uh, across universities. Uh, even pandemic. We also conduct you know, virtual career fair, the NVCF. This is the uh, new way of industry, of the, the world of, of job uh, hunters to link with students, the new graduates. We conduct the national virtual career fair for a uh, full three months uh, from May to July. And has been participated by more than 1,000 students. And uh, this is a good way for the industry to recruit the best talents as well as uh, for, for new graduates to uh, get a job. Let's learn from what we uh, see in the past seven months. We see that uh, there is a uh, almost instant adaptations of our, our campus to adapt to uh, to uh, talk into use technology and delivering courses. And suddenly we see that the creativity uh, out during the pandemic is 
beyond expectation. It's really amazing. And we have to promote that and continue what we uh, already achieved in the past uh, seven months. And thousands of invention uh, came out from university. And the spirit of Gotong Royong, the spirit of uh, working together, and helping each other, is very strong. So this uh, spirit to be maintained uh, beyond the uh, pandemic era. So toward the new normal, we have to maintain good practices that we already have and keep adapting uh, ourselves to the uh, pandemic. We could not just hide uh, and not, not facing this uh, reality. We have to adapt with the new reality by preventing ourselves, by protecting uh, each other, caring each other, uh, although the class might open, but uh, strict uh, protocols need to be in place and everyone to be observant uh, to make sure that no uh, transmission of virus uh, occurs during the uh, offline uh, process. Because we we also realized that online could not replace any, anything. Uh, replace something and have some advantage, but not all can go uh, online. Although there are many creativity, many of the campuses like developing virtual reality, augmented reality, enhanced reality for uh, laboratory active practices, for instance, but uh, human to human, people to people connection uh, is not uh, replaceable through uh, online uh, activities. So we, we permit campus to open, but under a very strict uh, protocols. And if we succeed, uh, student can actually become the ambassador for spread of new uh, normal, the spread of new culture of not uh, like wearing masks, uh, keeping distance, uh, and healthy habit to be in place. If they can be the ambassador for uh, social change, the ambassador for uh, more resilience community, that is what we uh, want to see and expect to see by the support of the university. We can change the society to be more uh, resilience to the uh, pandemics. So with that, I conclude my presentations and thank you very much for the uh, opportunity. Uh, God bless you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. For a brief, brief moment, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to enjoy performances by students of Faculty of Education and Teacher Training as home to multicultural students, traditional dance performances by students of Faculty of Education and Teacher Training, Universitas Kristen, Indonesia.
dan bangsa yo bangkit bersama For a brief moment, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to invite you to turn your camera on because we are going to have a photo session. We would like to invite Professor Nizam and Professor Agus Sartono to turn your camera on and the committee will help us to take picture together from your uh, room, Zoom room. I'm sure there will be a screen capture by the committee. Please give me a sign so that I can count in one, two, three, and then the picture will be taken. Are we ready to go? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna count from one, two, three. Okay, once again. Uh, serious pose or with smiling faces? With smiling faces, okay. One, two, three. Nice. I'm sure beautiful faces. Okay, okay. once again. Slide, okay, because there are so many participants, we're thankful for that. Now we have to take pictures for many slides. Now we're going to slides number two. The picture will be taken in one, two, three. Okay, once again, slide two, once again, one, two, three. Okay, how many slides left? Okay, we're done. The first slide. Wow, we have so many slides, so many participants for this international conference. Let's give a round of applause once again for this International Conference of Education and Science organized by Faculty of Education and Teacher Training, Universitas Krispong, Indonesia. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now we are coming to the plenary session one. There will be three invited speakers for this plenary session. Mr. Matthew Kenneth Miller from Tokyo University of Foreign Studies, 
Dr. Nathan Pinto from Broad University, USA, and Professor Amrin Saragi from Universitas Negeri Medan, Indonesia. And our moderator for this session is Mr. Parlindungan Pardede M. Hum. Before we invite Mr. Parlindungan Pardede to come on stage, allow me to read a brief introduction about him. Mr. Parlindungan Pardede got his bachelor's degree in English later from Universitas Pajajaran Bandung, Indonesia, and master's degree from Jakarta State University. He has been teaching English at some universities in Indonesia since 1998, and he is now a permanent lecturer at the English Education Department of Universitas Kristen, Indonesia. Major subjects he used to teach include research, methodology, language skills, and English literature. His research interests cover writing and reading skills, blended learning, critical thinking in ELT, and use of fiction in ELT. He established a Journal of English Teaching, or simply called JET, in 2011 and served as its editor-in-chief in 2015 to 2019. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Parindungan Pardede. Give a big round of applause for our moderator today. All right, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, on behalf of the second ICES committee, our host and I warmly welcome you all to this first plenary session. We are grateful to have this session because two outstanding speakers will serve to insp inspirational different topics for us. Actually, we were supposed to, to have three speakers in this sessions. Unfortunately, one of them, Dr. Nathan Tintal, could not join us for uh, certain circumstances. However, the two speakers that we are hearing now, I believe, will inspire us with their uh, inspirational ideas. And then, in this, uh, during this, this, this session, the host and I will serve you all. But before we start the presentation, let me inform you the procedure for these sessions. First, the two speakers will present their topic in about 25 minutes each. Audience, I will come to address questions during the presentation by writing in the chatting room of Zoom or YouTube we are using. And since the first speaker, Mr. Matthew, cannot join us synchronously. We will listen to his presentation to a video letter. In the 
discussion sessions in the question and answer sessions later, uh, we, uh, you can address the questions only to Professor Amrin, the second speaker. While the questions to Mr. Matthew will be collected by the committee and then sent to him via email. Once again, the question and answer session will be held soon after the second presentation finished, during which Professor Amri will reply every question addressed to him as far as we still have time for it. Before listening to the presentation that will be played by the host to the video, let me briefly introduce you all to Mr. Matthew. Mr. Matthew obtained his master degree in linguistics or TESOL from the University of Surrey, England. And now he is an English educator who dedicates most of his time as a visiting lecturer in various universities, especially in Japan. He's also a productive writer in the field of English teaching and an active contributor in various conferences worldwide. Today, he will talk about what I, I should say about two general ideas for most of us. I think that is about questions and instructions. However, Mr. Matthew will uh, share ideas about how to refocus questions and instructions for deeper learning. Mr. Host, you can start playing Mr. Kenneth's video, please, and beloved audience. Have a nice watching. Good morning. My name is Matthew Miller, and I teach English as a foreign language at Tokyo University of Foreign Studies. I'm very happy to be here at the uh, conference, although virtually. I attended last year and enjoyed it very, very much. And uh, I regret not being us not being able to be together this year, but I'm looking forward to next year when hopefully we can all be together again. Uh, but anyway, what I'd like to share with you today, is about refocusing questions and instructions for deeper learning. And what I mean by this is, uh, I think that teachers, not not just foreign language teachers, but teachers uh, in all, all fields, uh, I think we are asking the wrong questions and we are um, asking our students to do the wrong things. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Have a look at these questions. These are very typical questions that you would find in an English language uh, classroom, whether it's uh, for homework or in class activities, uh, perhaps even on a test. So for example, that first question, what year was the man born? So, you know, my students would read something or listen to something or watch a video, and then they would have to uh, answer this question. And, you know, this is a very typical type of comprehension question that we might ask. It doesn't really require a lot of deep understanding of the material. All they have to do is listen for a year. And all of these questions are, are similar in that way. Um, they are just listening for, for they don't really need to understand the material very deeply. Um, and even this last uh, set of instructions translate this from Japanese into English. So when my students do an activity like this, um, they're looking up every word, translating it from Japanese into English, and at the end of the activity, they don't really have a deep understanding of what they just translated. And so, um, this is the type of questioning that, and instruction giving that I'm talking about that we need to get away from uh, for our students to truly, deeply learn the material and to be able to use that material in a real way. Have a look at this quote. 
Studies of classroom instruction confirm that only 20% of questions posed by teachers require more than simple factual recall, clearly pointing to a need for more teachers to become familiar with and use higher order questions to encourage deeper learning. And that was so true for me. Most of my questions were those simple um, factual recall questions that I showed you just before. Um, and very few required, um, you know, really deep thinking. Um, so that's what I want to show you today, how we can change the way that we're asking our students questions, uh, change the way that we give instructions for activities, uh, homework, even tests. And this is uh, called Bloom's Taxonomy of Educational Objectives, and it shows different kinds of questions. Now, there are several different taxonomies or classifications of types of questions out there. I've chosen uh, Bloom's taxonomy just because it might be the, the most well-known, uh, and it's pretty much what my questions are now based on. So let's have a look. Number one, um, this type of question is what I showed you at the beginning. It simply requires them to remember what they've heard or read. Um, they're just recounting facts from the, from the text or the listening. So for example, did they take a train or a bus? What is the main character's name? So again, you know, it doesn't require any thinking. They just have to pick up on the answer. They just have to search for the answer. And there's right and wrong answers to this. Um, there's no gray area, right? Uh, and, you know, the good thing about questions like this is it's easy for the teacher to grade since it's right or wrong. Um, however, as I said, it doesn't require any deep thinking and thus no deep learning. So let's go up a level to the type two questions. Um, these are comprehension questions, understanding. What did the actor mean when he said he was green with envy? And so, you know, I guess one of my students could just look this up in the dictionary, um, but it still requires a little bit more effort on their part, and thus they're going to learn a little bit more. Or this one, read paragraph three again and explain it in just one sentence. So it requires them to understand uh, the paragraph that they read and summarize it and then use their language skills uh, to summarize it in just one sentence. So you can already tell just going up a level to this slightly more complex style of uh, question or instructions um, can lead to a lot more learning. But let's go up another level. Uh, type three, this is application. So um, this requires the students not just to understand the material, but to take that material and be able to apply it in a personal way. For example, uh, how would you personally use this information to study better? So perhaps they've listened to or read about study tips. They have to understand that and then try to think of how they can actually use that information. Or uh, the other one, predict what would happen in our town if the government changed the law. So they've read or listened to something about um, some law and then they have to imagine the future uh, and the consequences of applying this law. So again, they're using much more complex thinking skills and uh, it requires them to use their English language in much more complex and real ways. Thus, they're learning more deeply. Okay, uh, let's move up. Number four, analyzation. So um, this is where they actually analyze the material that they've been given. Uh, so how might the reporter's bias affect the story? Here they're required to use critical thinking skills and um, imagine what kind of bias the writer would have had. And, or the second one, how does this film use light to communicate mood? And so here they're not even um, using the comprehension skills 
they're looking at the material in a totally different way from a different perspective, but still having to use their English language skills to explain them. Um, so let's move up to number five, evaluation. And this is giving um, opinions, right? So for example, what would you recommend to the main character in the story? I use this type of question a lot when we're reading um, short stories or novels. I'll stop their reading when the character has a decision to make. And I have them talk about, okay, what if this was you? Um, what would you do in this situation? And again, it requires um, them to think about themselves and to change their perspective, try to understand the character's perspective, um, and then express that in English. So they're doing a lot of different things, practicing a lot of different skills here. It's much more difficult, much more complex, but involves a lot of deep learning. Uh, another example, which opinion do you most agree with and why? So asking their opinion about the material is very important. I have a lot of students who uh, come back from studying abroad and they often tell me, uh, you know, everybody was asking me my opinion about things and I didn't know how to express it. And unfortunately, here in Japan, in our foreign language education system, students are mostly practicing question types one and two they are very rarely asked to give their opinion about anything. And so when they're in a situation where they have to do that, they're lost. It's not that they don't have an opinion, it's just that they've never practiced giving it or expressing it. Um, and so that's why these types of questions are so important because this is what they're gonna be doing in the real world. Okay, and then the last type, creation. Um, this is where, based on the material that they have read or listened to or watched, um, they create something. For example, design a lesson plan according to the video suggestions about education. So they've watched um, something about maybe an educational theory, and then they have to create a lesson based on that. Or make a similar recipe, but using ingredients that we can easily get in Japan. So again, maybe they've read a recipe, but they have to change it according to, uh, you know, the kind of, of food that we can uh, readily get in Japan, forces them to be creative, use their imagination. And again, unfortunately, um, foreign language education in Japan uh, doesn't allow the students to be imaginative or creative, and it should, uh, because again, these types of things are what they're really gonna be using this language for uh, when they go out into real life, whether they're, they're going to be working abroad or studying abroad, uh, or perhaps using English at work. Um, this is what we should be having our students do with their language. And I just want to say that, you know, this applies to anything, whether you're teaching biology or history or literature or a foreign language, these kinds of questions are what we need to refocus uh, on. Now, I will show you a specific example from a writing course that I teach. Um, each week, this is just, we do lots of stuff in class, but I'm just gonna show you what I give them for homework. I usually give them a newspaper article, magazine article, or perhaps a poem or lyrics from a song, maybe even part of a script from a play or a movie. And then I ask them one of each of the types of questions that I just showed you. And in this course, I make my students aware of these different kinds of questions and give them the skills to answer them uh, well. And so, you know, like I said, my students come to university already being able to answer type one and two very, very well. Um, so usually we focus on the other four types of questions and I'll, I'll show you what, what they are. So this newspaper article or uh, yeah, newspaper article is about how to survive uh, a very long flight. And so question number one, um, how are most long haul air carriers configured? So my students don't even need to understand the question they know that if they search for this keyword, 
Um, they can find the answer. Ah, configure, okay, here's the answer. They can just copy it down. No learning involved. <laughs> it's just a matter of searching, copying, pasting. Uh, then question number two, this requires a little more thought. What does he mean by these phrases? Um, so this involves a couple of, uh, of um, idioms. And again, they can scan for the answer, but they have to read this phrase in context to understand it. So a little bit higher level learning going on here. And then look at question number three. Imagine you are flying from New York to, or Tokyo to New York. What information from this reading would you try? So this is the, um, where they have to apply it to their own lives, um, figure out how this information is useful to them. Number four, how reliable is the information in this article? What makes you believe the reporter? This involves critical reading skills. Um, I want them to think about, um, you know, can I trust this information source? How much of this is true? Where did the um, reporter in this case get this information? That kind of thing. Uh, number five, which piece of advice seems best? Which do you not agree with? This is the opinion thing. I want and the last one, number six, give some advice for travelers who must take long trips. This is where they get to be creative. They get to think of their own ideas uh, and share these. And so in the class, I have them email me their answers um, to the homework so I can check to make sure that they are answering them um, in a thoughtful and a clear way. And I often write back to them and say, uh, you know, your answer to number five, could you explain it more clearly, please? I don't understand uh, your opinion here. Um, and so then by the time we come to class and I have them share their answers in small groups, um, they have pretty good answers. And I've gotten some good feedback about this, this particular exercise. Uh, each year, many of my students say that this is their favorite thing to do, to talk about the homework in class with their classmates uh, because it allows them to get to know each other a lot better. Um, if they are just talking about questions one and two, everybody should have the same answers. So you don't get to learn anything about each other. And probably you're not gonna remember or, or maybe even understand anything about this article. However, um, the questions that require deeper understanding, require personal um, expression, this helps them not only get to know the material better, it helps them practice their English a lot more and in a real way. And what my students say they enjoy about it the most is that they get to know their classmates a lot better. They make friends through um, sharing their personal thoughts, experiences, and opinions with each other. Now, so why did I start doing this? What made me aware of the fact that we need to refocus uh, the way we ask questions or give instructions uh, in our classrooms? Well, when I was a high school student, I had a, an amazing history teacher who, um, you know, up until this class, all of my history classes were just memorizing dates and names and places. And it was totally uninteresting to me. I never liked history before until this class. And it was because he asked um, the higher order questions. Of course, we still had to remember the dates and the places and the names. Uh, however, most of the class was spent talking about our opinion about these historical events, or um, answering questions like, imagine you were a high school student at this time when this historical event took place, what would you have done? How would you have felt? Um, those kinds of questions, and we discussed them, and that was the first time I loved history. It was the first time that I understood why we need to study history, why history is important to us, um, today, how we can apply it to our lives, because he asked all of these 
different types of questions in that class. Now, as a university student, I wasn't aware of what he was doing, of course. It's only now as a teacher that I can look back and think, oh, wow, he was brilliant. He did that on purpose, and I want to do that in my classes. And so many years ago, I remember teaching uh, a listening course, and I was giving a test, and the students had to listen to a radio show. And it was a young woman uh, talking about a really funny story that happened between her and her father. And as I was watching my students, you know, all of them had very serious faces, and they were uh, you know, working really hard trying to answer all the uh, did you think, but, and I told them they didn't laugh, so I think they didn't, and that made me realize I am asking the wrong questions on my test, so to this day, I still use that listening sometimes on tests, this radio program, uh, or imagine you are that young woman, how would you feel if this happened to you and your father, or tell me about the listening, but it requires them to do so much more. Um, they have to apply it to themselves or express their opinion, uh, what they're strong at uh, and what they need work. So you give your students. And again, I just wanna say, this is not just for, for foreign language learning. It can be applied in any field topic. Please feel about language, about education. And um, so you can contact me at either of those places. All right. What an interesting presentation. Thanks to uh, Mr. Kenneth. And dear participants, uh, you have seen that how Kenneth showed us to refocus what we are supposed to know, optimize using them for deeper learning, especially by uh, applying them to develop thinking skills, in this case, in relation to Bloom's taxonomy. If you, or if you have uh, questions related to the topic, feel free, once again, to write in the chatting platform of our Zoom, and UT will collect your questions and then uh, send it to Mr. Kenneth, and Mr. Kenneth will yeah, now, so Amrin Saragi, our second speaker, present his uh, topic. Let me provide you a uh, read. I, I mentioned only the most common one. Professor Amrin Saragi obtained his PhD in linguistic from La Trobe University, Melbourne, Australia in 1996. He has been teaching in the Faculty of Language and Arts of Maiden State University since 1982. Besides teaching in various postgraduate programs in many universities in Indonesia, he is also active, an active researcher and writer in linguistic. Since 2014, he serves as the head of linguistic postgraduate study program of Medan State University. Today, Professor Saragi will share his ideas about how to enhance creation of critical literacies. The topic is actually common to us. It concerns with critical literacies and systemic functional linguistic. But now, Professor, Professor Saragi will show us how we can use uh, Professor Saragi. We know it might be a little bit hard to present such a complex topic in a very limited time, but we do hope and we believe you can see minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, Prof, all the audience is yours. Good luck. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Pak uh, Pordede. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, to say then things related to 
text-based language learning as inspired by systemic functional linguistics, of course, and then see the social context in Indonesia at the moment. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the what we have at the starting point is uh, critical literacy itself as the intersections of uh, critical literacy with global. When we talk about uh, uh, the global educations developed in response to international issues, while multicultural education to national minority struggles. And the goals of global education is to enable students to learn about their rights and responsibility and prepare them with the skill to for democratic participation from local level to global one then. And as a whole, you can say that the goal of multicultural education is addressing issues related to race, culture, to critical and political practices, examining the relationship of language to power in text. Also, when we talk about critical literacy, it covers the use of print and other media technologies to analyze, critique, and transform the norms, rule system, and practices governing the social field of institutions and everyday life then. Now, text-based language learning. Uh, the area of language learnings are one, learning to use language. Secondly, learning through language. And thirdly, learning about language or usage. This is the point which is deeply rooted in the systemic functional linguistic theory. Though number one and number two have been in our traditions in Indonesia, but number one and three, sorry, and but number two is a new one, a new area to language learning, that is learning through language. So in our field of language learning, particularly English language learning, what we are going to do is that in the strata of semantics, lexical grammar, phonology, and graphology, that's the first. Now, we have so far uh, three kinds of syllabi. situational syllabus, notional syllabus, and functional syllabus. These are three area that we commonly refer our learner covers the area in learning reality. That is to say that when we learn language, be it first language, second language, or foreign language, we teach our student is not an empty one. It has been filled with reality. And that means values, cultures, and ideology in the text. Secondly, when they learn a language, they learn to compare learn social cultural aspects in the first language with those in other languages, particularly in the target language. So meaning that when we learn a foreign language, it's not merely learning the foreign language, but learn to see how our first language or mother tongue them. And when we learn a foreign language, it means we learn to realize of being imprisoned by lexical grammatical, if you like, then we are jailed anyway in, in one language and we, we try to understand the situation in the target language and compare with our first language then. And semiotically, learners interpreted uh, how one point in the target language being language then. Thirdly, of course, this has been uh, the classical one we, need, we do in Indonesia, uh, we, we learn about language, which is usage then. So learning the mechanism of language, certain patterns, 
singular and plural, that sort of things, then it has been the traditional we do then. So again, learning to use language, learning reality and learning uh, about language, which is used. Uh, systemic functional linguistic is the basis for text-based language learning uh, in which we have the theory, or if you like then, that language exists in the social context and social context and language terms, what we call uh, semiotic one then, uh, construal semiotic, if you like, then that is to say that social context is dependent on language and in its turn language, again, is dependent on language then. So when we talk about social context, we cover at least these three area, the area of ideology, genre, situation, and then language itself then. In detail, I just want to show that when we talk about language, we really cover this area, uh, semantic, lexical grammar, uh, phonology in, in the case of spoken language, uh, graphology in the case of spoken uh, written language, and uh, sign in case uh, sign language then. So language also means indirectly learning how to draw experience, covering how to represent your experience, how to link your experience, how to exchange your experience how to, and how to organize your experience. So, so that's basically the contents of the material that we're going to do then. So simply, this is how it works in the uh, systemic functional context of Indonesia at the moment. So, well, it, it's been in the fact that we are facing that is some sort of problem, or some sort of threat in our national unity because of uh, disintegration, because of group uh, radicalism and intolerance. Now, language learning should participate in this case learning reality that has been united as all, but in the last five years, seven years, if you like them, there's some sort of threat. Then of course, there's something wrong in the practice of our educations. And therefore we language teachers or English language teachers specifically should play a role in weaving this national unity. Uh, so that, that means we integrate language learning and critical literacy. Our objective is to affirm pluralisms and promote equity and social justice for all members of the society at the social level, at the national level, and to learn the rights and responsibility and to prepare with skill for democratic participants from the local or national level to the global one. Now with respect to language learning or English language learning, for example, what functions should we do as teachers or lecturers? This is how we realize that one thing. Then when language learning is based on text or text-based language learning, then that would mean we have a possibility of presenting the material through genre or coding the text in genre at, at various levels, for example. It can be the genre of descriptions, explanation, procedures, or whatever. And then we also realize that sort of uh, language with respect to the element of the process, participant, circumstance, ideas, or whatever terminology with respect to language. Now, here it is. This is our experience at the Universitas Negri Medan. So first, at the first stage, we just take simple things. For example, take food, uh, attires, selected as the simple thing through which we can address critical literacy through systemic functional linguistics. Take, for example, the food of the Batak, traditional Batak, for example, the Arsic, which is, you know, uh, 
fish being uh, cooked in such a way, in the Batak way, if you like them. And then we have this sort of in Sumatra Utara, for example, in North Sumatra, uh, we are familiar with this kind of uh, food, traditional food from the Japanese. And then also the ulos or the gotong from the Badak and Blancon or whatever's in there. We just want them and then we try to present that in a certain genre, be it description genre. So student will read the text about this traditional food or traditional attires, for example. That's the first stage. At the second stage, we consider multiple viewpoint or dimensions addressed to the student. And we expect that the student would respond to the following problem. Simple question, for example, how do you like the Arsic food of the Batak, for example? How do you like the lonto of the Javanese, for example? How do you like the put in the way you do? What aspect are worth noting as being special about the put? Uh, why do the Bataks or the Japanese, for example, prefer the put in the way they do? And there is some sort of uh, interactions among the students, be it group discussions or individual responses to that sort of questions. That's the second stage then. At the, test, at the third stage, there is some sort of focusing on the socio-political matters dimensions. Uh, that, that's the point that, uh, that is addressed. The students are asked much deeper about ideological problem. For example, question, is it fair to discriminate people by their food? Is it fair to discriminate people by their taste? Is it fair to discriminate people by their ideology? Is it fair to discriminate people by their ancestor, for example? In such a case, there is a discussion of group discussions or individual interactions about the point. And in this case, teachers of course participate at how far to give deeper understanding of cultural or group problems in our society. Then at the fourth stage, we're taking action and promoting social justice dimension is addressed. The student in group are asked to carry out the following agenda where understanding cultural values are addressed as the following. For example, write a pamphlet saying that it is not fair to discriminate people by their food or attire. Write poster saying that any group ideology is by itself unique. Write a pamphlet that is much more natural to have unity in diversity rather than posing unity. And then write a petition, for example, claim that radicalism and intolerance will lead to national disintegration. So in this case, teacher will have much more creativity. So my point is we start from simple thing because the simple thing has been filled with cultural and ideological aspect. And this can be used to as, as, a, as a material for language learning and to address so that we can enhance our national unity. Uh, the Universitas Negri Medan, we have this six assignment, routine assignment, critical book review, critical general reviews, uh, minor research, idea engineering. Well, the one I love is idea engineering. We try our student to, uh, we ask our student to uh, develop some sort of idea through which they can make up, you know, uh, innovative thinking to respond to the present situation of social context in Indonesia. And finally, we have projects. Ladies and gentlemen, critical literacies, language learning and systemic functional linguistic are three elements which are potentially elaborated to address our present situations. Our main point is how to enhance our national unity and to find out how we can solve the problem. This is a special practice in education. So teaching learners meaning of text critically as a conclusion, number one, teaching learners meaning of text critically by Harrison Pairways Day.
However, we need to have that no neutral or value-free tax as inherently a tax has been loaded by the meaning of social context, as I mentioned previously, that any tax, any word is there, has been loaded with a uh, meaning of uh, context of situations, uh, culture and ideology. Critical literacy potentially combined with text-based language learning to address social issues such as national integration of Indonesia. So lexicogrammatical and textual aspect need enhancing in the context of functional grammatics in the context of parent language learning that. Then finally, I conclude that further studies should be done to investigate the effectiveness of language learning materials developed in integration with principle of critical literacy. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all the point that I would like to share with you in this conference. Thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thank you very much for the inspirational presentation, Beth. I guess uh, most of us, most of the audience uh, are enlightened by the new ideas. Even I myself, I have never thought that uh, English teaching could be utilized, could be used. Uh, to, to, to contribute to the effort of uh, effort to national unity. And while waiting, while waiting for the committee to collect the questions, Prof, uh, can you please provide a, let's, let's say practical, practical uh, ideas, practical ideas, how can English teachers can use their teaching to contribute to national unity? You have actually explained in your presentation that you can use English education, English teaching to familiarize one's group ID, just uh, like including RSIC, blank on to the to the to the materials included in the teaching or we can also uh, we, we need also to use the materials the teaching the english teaching to promote social justice uh, uh, dimension uh, to make it clearer could you please prove because not all of the audience have a linguistic background could you please provide us, uh, let's say, practical, practical ideas, how English teachers can use their classes to contribute to national unity. Thank you. Right. Um, any word, any text, if you like, then, I, I just want to use the term text, which mean it can be a word, it can be a phrase, it can be a sound, it can be a clause, it can be a sentence or paragraph. So any text has been loaded with the meaning of situations, culture, and ideology. 
So when we present a tech, when we ask our learner to learn a text, that means they are learning situational aspects, cultural and ideology in the text. Then we can say that what is language learning actually is not only learning language, not only learning the world, but also learning the, not only learning the word, but learning the world, if you like that. So, so not, not only learning uh, the, the vocabulary, the sound system, the syntax, subject, web, object, but we learn culture, we learn ideology through language. Now, once we give this to our student, then this is a good forum for us to discuss. I just take an example of traditional Batak food, uh, which is arsic, cooked in a special way by the Batak. And also in, in North Sumatra, we have the lontong, for example. What is it made of? And this is just a symbolism, a symbolic way of thinking. And we can discuss about this. We can extend our ex uh, discussion related to whatever it is, social or cultural or political aspects then. And we combine together by which we have a good discussion. Because some people like Arsic, others do not. Then the question is, how can we manipulate these sort of things then to make unity? Because we don't want to discriminate people because of their taste, because of their group, their identity. We should unite all this in our beautiful country, the Republic of Indonesia. That's what's the main point that I would like practically, if you ask me practically. So let, let me give an example, uh, pa, uh, Pardede. Now, in, in, in Indonesia, we raise a question like this one then. Tadi malam bapak tidur pukul berapa? Tadi malam bapak tidur pukul berapa? Then we say pukul sebelas. This is really not not true. Ini tidak benar sesungguhnya. Sebab kalau kita tahu tidur jam 11, bermakna kita belum tidur. Hanya Tuhan yang tahu pukul berapa kita tidur tadi malam. English, bahasa Inggris, English, don't, the, the, you know, speakers of English do not raise such a question. They raise questions, what time did you go to bed? Pergi ke tempat tidur yang kita tahu. Tidurnya kita tidak tahu, Tuhan yang tahu. So that means there are two perspectives we need to discuss them. And that's a good forum where we can discuss perspective. Forum untuk mendiskusikan perspektif yang berbeda, mencari titik temu. And, and that's an important aspect in, in education. Sebab kita tak biasakan kita memiliki konsep yang berbeda untuk didiskusikan. I think that's the underlying matters at the moment in our uh, education. Similarly, because when you learn English, you don't just learn English, but you try to understand your own language. Kita belajar bahasa Inggris, tidak semata-mata belajar bahasa Inggris itu, tetapi belajar melihat bagaimana bahasa Inggris bisa kita gunakan menambah wawasan dan mengubah, merancang bangun bahasa Indonesia. Let me take another example. Well, Indonesian will raise such a question, uh, tang, kapan anda lahir? So that's how we raise questions in Bahasa Indonesia. The reality is that's kapan anda lahir. Tapi pemakai Bahasa Inggris tidak pernah lahir. They raise the question, when were you born? Kapan anda dilahirkan? Mereka semua dilahirkan, kita lahir, okay which is another way of so, uh, the, the discussion in, in such a case then. Okay, so that's of interest to discuss about that. Okay, why? Because that's that's our culture and that, that things that we're going to discuss then. Kami pergi ke pesta itu dan makan ayam, makan kambing, things like that one then. Itu biasa dalam our culture, but not in English. Penutur bahasa Inggris tidak makan ayam. Mereka memakan Ya, gulai ayam. Ya. Mereka tak memakan uh, kambing, tapi 
dagingnya yang mereka konsumsi we had beef we had mutton tapi kita kan kambingnya yang kita makan atau ayam yang kita makan so that's not a problem we need to discuss there's a problem for us to discuss that and that is the point jadi kalau Pak Pardiri memiliki semacam pemikiran dalam negara kita ini maka saya juga memiliki pemikiran kita berdiskusi we discuss and the difference we come to an understanding that here we go we are in the same country in this community we need to be together to build up our country and that's what i mean by enhancing national unity in the context of indonesia so very simple one then from traditional food from traditional attire you can move up to various aspect address in our social context of indonesia so that's my point pak perdede okay thank you very much prof for the inspirational answer and let me read a questions from siti amina uh, even though it is not closely related but still in the same topic i think Uh, Mr. Amrin Saragi, thank you for the interesting presentation. I'm Siti Amina from Moha. My question is related to the phenomenon of regional languages that has disappeared in society. Nowadays, many local languages have lost their speakers. Young generation are not interested in using the local language. What should we do? You can answer it, re reply to it directly, Prof, before I read another question to you. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. I think the best solution is through education. Education, that will be the, the prime, the prime means through which we try to um, internalize our local languages. Uh, well, any language, as I have displayed, as you have seen in the display, any language is loaded with aspects of situations, aspects of culture, and aspects of ideology. So um, never thinks that the word mother is identical with Ibu in English because culturally and ideologically, the word Ibu and mother are really different, okay? So if you ask me semantically, is mother and Ibu Uh, the same, my answer is yes. So when you ask me, apakah ibu dalam bahasa Indonesia, then I will respond to that. Ibu adalah wanita dewasa yang potensial melahirkan, mengasuh bayi, dan uh, menyusuinya. Okay, in English, yes, I also respond in such a case. What's a mother? A mother is a adult female, potentially delivers baby, breastfeed the baby, nurses the baby. But when it comes up to culture, kalau masuk ke budaya, mulai berbeda. Because ibu in bahasa Indonesia, we can say ibu kota. But in English, I think we don't have mother city. But we have motherland, yeah? ibu pertiwi, which is more or less similar. Uh, the level of culture, yes, still similar. But when we go up to ideology, then we have different things then. So say, for example, in Bahasa Indonesia, we have the terminology, we have the expressions of surga itu di telapak kaki ibu. So heaven is associated to a mother's feet. But not in English. Dalam Bahasa Inggris, orang bingung kalau anda katakan heaven is on your mother's feet. So symbolically, that's how we appreciate our mother. Sebab kalau surga berada di telapak kaki ibu budaya uh, ideologi Indonesia, lalu apalagi dia diubun-ubun seorang ibu. That's how we appreciate that one. Day. 
So when we speak Bahasa Batak, when you speak Japanese, when you speak Malays, indeed you have had yourself in the jail dalam penjara berpikir ideologi sesuatu bahasa itu. Jadi kalau suatu bahasa hilang, if a language vanish, if a language finish, that mean we loses the ideology culture in that language. Then. So you can imagine at the moment, local languages to prioritize Bahasa Indonesia and to learn foreign languages. Put that in such a framework, then we are in a very stable situation in Indonesia. That's my response, Pak Pardede. I do hope that you don't mind to reply to some more. Now, I have combined three questions into one. Here is the next question. Uh, uh, threat to the threat of our national in disintegration, including geographical factor, cultural diversity. But we are curious why you, you, you put educational malpractice as one of the, the factors that threat to the national disintegration. Uh, is it because our educational system, especially uh, some, some years in the past, focus on learning for examination? Or do you think that it is because the learning in our school focus on developing, uh, focusing on learning for examination, but not for developing thinking, for literacy, as you have ex, uh, uh, explained to us. Uh, make it clear. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm talking about the in, in general sort of discussions. Then we are in a situation to be together. And, and that is the point, I think, in the education in largest and not the children sort of things then in our society then. So yes, my point is language is a very fundamental thing to use to address uh, differences, to weave, untuk menenun, untuk membangun. So do you mean to say that actually in the language learning, we should uh, optimize uh, the language learning to address uh, differences, to talk about, to discuss about differences between uh, among the students themselves. Differences yes. should not be avoided. Yes, that's one point. But again, I have mentioned three areas of language learning. Yeah. So first, learning to use language. That's in the terminology of language learning we say use. Uh, secondly, we learn about language. We learn to use language, which is used. We learn about language, which is grammar. We learn grammar, we learn patterns. Uh, subject, verb, object, adjective, noun, that sort of things then. That's learn about language. And then the latest development, particularly in systemic functional theory, we learn through language. Because the language we learn is not just word, it's not just sound, it's not just pattern, it's not just rule, but reality is there. And that what sort of reality? That's what we call context of situations, culture, and ideology. It has been built is in detail. And this is the best point through which language teachers, language education enter the problem then. In other words, language teachers should be provided with ability to make use learning through language. So teachers, language teachers are person who are provided with ability to address all these sort of things then. Not only learning grammar or learning word or uh, learning this sort of sentence patterns or whatever in, in our case then. Okay. That's my point. Then. Okay, Prof. Thank you very much. So I got the point. It is not enough to teach our students to master English, for instance, technique, let's say that. Uh, but of a way, 
we should also add, I mean to say, it is not enough if the students learn language about the language itself. Uh, the last question, possibly, Prof. Uh, it is said that and creativity, so I suggestion how and creative thinking to. Well, um, I, I think this is of interest, uh, Pardide. Uh, in the 21st century, uh, the poor CS are of important uh, element in our education, critical, creativity, collaborative, and communicative, that sort of things, and critical. Now, my point is this one then. Uh, what does it mean by being critical? You see the point in the social context of Indonesia uh, that when you criticize someone, then it's not really a criticism. Then. It's some sort of protest then. Kita tak terbiasa dengan kritik. Kalau dikritik, merah muka, angkat tinju dan berkelahi. That sort of things then. Because we are not yet ready for uh, criticisms then. So when you criticize, and in, in, in our context of Bahasa Indonesia, we say, uh, critic membangun or construct. I say when you criticize, when you criticize things, one is you look at the good honestly to protest or to claim that it's not some sort of uh, uh, criticizes. So critically, that means you look at from a very stand, whatever standpoint, and comes up with a very, the very three things, what I mentioned just now. So critically, yes, language is very critical one. It, it, when you learn a language, it, it's needed that you are very critical about that sort of thing. Very open, when I lecture to my students, I just make a, a, an anecdote. I will be saying like this one then, uh, can you see the difference between I and saya? Then I say, oh, it's just the same. But I say that, I said to my student, saya in Bahasa Indonesia is a very strong one because saya can be put under whatever circumstances then. You can have saya mengirim surat, you can say surat saya, then you can say kepada saya. So this saya is very strong. But in English, this I is not very strong because sometimes you will have I but you cannot say to I, it must be to me. Jadi kalau I berkawan dengan noun, dia tak kuat, harus berubah menjadi my. So we say my book. Then you don't say to I, but to me. I look at it critically from the standpoint of semiotics. Then. So it's a very nice discussion to us then with reference to grammar. Then. Uh, also, when when Yes, uh, when someone is addressing Selamat Pagi, but English speakers would be saying good morning, no matter under whatever circumstances. So one is a matter of Selamat and another one is good. Okay, so we can have a very nice discussions about this one then. So yes, we look at it from various perspective critically. And that's the point that I, I argue that when you learn English, you don't really just learn English, but you try to understand your uh, Bahasa Indonesia, your local language or whatever it is. So language learning is, if you like, interdisciplinary things, then, interdisciplinary subject. So an English teacher would have grammar jika satu bahasa digunakan untuk uh, sejarah. The grammar would be very different from the grammar of chemia, for example, or chemistry. So a text in history would be using lexical grammatical deep, uh, aspect differently from that of history. So we address that sort of thing then. So language is really what we call knowledge carrier. Bahasa itu adalah penghela ilmu pengetahuan. Bahasa menunjukkan kalau kimia digunakan, grammarnya berbeda. And that's looked at critically from the standpoint of systemic functional linguistics. So we don't just learn this is the subject, verb, object, that sort of things. Let me give a very simple example, Pak Pardere. Is really my wife, my book, 
and my nose the same grammatically. Yes, with respect to formal grammar, bila dilihat dari tata bahasa formal, my book, my wife, my nose, this is just the same. Possessive adjective plus noun. My, 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 possessive adjective. Book, noun, wipe, noun, nose, noun. But they are really different. Tapi ketiga yang ini berbeda. My book, that is possession. I have a book, that's what it is there. But when you say my wife, no, it's not really I have a wife, but uh, I say someone function or someone position herself as a wife to me. But when I say my nose, there's something else then. It's not some sort of possessions, but alienation. When we can test it out in critically, tidak sama hubungan antara my book, my wife, dan my nose. Jika saya punya buku, when I have a book, I can put the book somewhere. Saya bisa letakkan buku itu di tempat lain, saya di tempat lain. My wife, istri juga bisa. Tetapi my nose tidak bisa. You cannot put your nose somewhere else and you in another side there. When you have a book, you can burn the book, you can throw away the book, you can do whatever to the book, but not to your right. At least we have, uh, you know, uh, ada sanksi hukum. Kalau saya punya buku, maka buku itu bisa saya buang, bisa saya campakkan, bisa saya tendang. Tapi istri tak bisa, sekurang-kurangnya ada sanksi hukum untuk itu. Jadi hubungan antara my wife dan my book tidak sama. My book itu milik my wife, Seseorang berfungsi atau berposisi istri kepada saya. Dan my nose bukan milik saya, bagian dari badan saya. So grammatically, they are the same. But when we look at it critically, we have different perspective. And by that, dan menggunakan itu, kita bisa membedakan apa bedanya iklan sampo dan iklan rokok. When you look at just the poem, they are just the same thing. But by using systemic functional linguistic, we can find out, here we go, the grammar of iklan sampo berbeda dengan iklan rokok. Bahasa Quran A berbeda dengan Quran B. Novel A berbeda dengan in such a way. That's what we call, look at the language critically. And when you look at it in that way, then you're quite familiar, ada bahasa yang sangat, I love my love, educate our society. There are some other questions. Even though I have tried to uh, combine audience over to original ideas, and um, yeah, and thank you for being uh, for your full attention, dear audience. And now I give the uh, the time to everything. Thank you very much, Mr. Padere, and for the invited speakers for wonderful sessions. I believe that uh, each and everyone here must have uh, gotten so many beneficial information. Today, December 9, 2020, is Parallel Session 1. And for Parallel Session 2 and 3, Parallel Session 1, please join the respective Zoom room, which has been determined before. For presenters of Parallel Session 2 and 3, Please register tomorrow via the respective Zoom meeting link with the schedule as followed. Parallel session one is from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Parallel session two is from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Now please enjoy your break time and see you in this main room tomorrow after parallel session two and three. Have a nice day and great presentation. God bless you.